So getting into the topic du jour of pest control, um, the client desires, as we talked about, um, informs your design, but it's also going to inform your pest management strategy. So sort of the general principles that I try to communicate to my clients is that, um, especially if you want to go with organic controls, it's going to take vigilance, and the less vigilant you are, the more pest problems you're going to have. So it's, it's a trade-off. You either have to be tolerant of damage, tolerant of losing some plants, or you have to be taking some walks through your garden every day. Um, knowing that not all bugs are pests, uh, and that using good sound cultural practices, good planning, and strong plants uh, is preferable over in extreme intervention. So, you know, that's kind of IPM in a nutshell. Um, but also setting your expectations for what ex uh, acceptable damage is. So, um, a good place to start is variety se selection. So you can either ch uh, start with just um, crops in general that have low pest pressure. So things like charred sweet potatoes in Maryland, I don't know, and this might be different here. Scurf is a disease that sweet potatoes get, but it tends to be prevalent in places that have had sweet potatoes planted year after year after year. So I haven't had any problems with that in any of my, um, my sites. Um, but other than that, there's, I mean, they're drought tolerant, they're just, uh, I think that might be my favorite. I've probably said that about a lot of things, but um, they're up there. Um, but then also choosing disease resistant varieties. So I looked on, um, looked at Kentucky Extension's um, website and this was the document that was already up there. I was excited to see. Um, so recommended vegetable cultivars. And I actually like this one better that, than the one that Maryland Extension publishes because ours was, I think it was a, um, put together by surveying um, hundreds of master gardeners, but ours does not specifically li list exactly what pest or disease that they're resistant to. Um, it just says these are the ones that tend to be su successful in Maryland home gardens. So use that. I'm not going to go over what favorite varieties of mine are because it might be different in Kentucky than it is in Maryland. Um, and there's plenty, there's this document as well as lots of seed catalogs to tell you that. Um, however, knowing that y choosing these varieties for uh, disease resistance might not satisfy a particular client who's really looking to have their Lola Rosa eggplant. All right, so again, that's where you have to explain the trade-off. Um, you're either going to have imperfect plants, or you're going to, um, or you're going to be able to have a, a lower pest pressure. Um, in certain cases, where you think that for whatever the client's expectations are. Or, um, or what type of garden they're trying to have. There's certain plants that you might just want to avoid. Eggplants, just after you get them to pass a certain point in the season, they're okay. But flea beetles just tend to be a problem. They, they can just be kind of a, a pest favorite. Um, and then squash family plants as well, same thing, especially for, for the funky fun, uh, mildewy diseases and bacterial wilt. Um, Every year I say, I'm just not going to plant any cucurbits this year, and then I do. And, and sometimes it's great, but sometimes it's not. All right, um, so another thing is to do companion planting. Um, and this is uh, kind of like grandma's way of gardening, in that there's, there's um, the book Carrots Love Tomatoes. That's kind of a classic text about companion planting, um, what plants to plant together that repel particular bugs and diseases. Um, but I was reminded by Sarah's talk, the other companions that you want to use are your native, um, particularly native flowering plants. Um, so those are going to attract your beneficials. They're um, not only the beneficial um, predators or parasitoids of your uh, pest plants, but also pollinators. Um, in addition, there's, you know, planting herbs is another way to attract beneficials. Um, not all of them are going to be natives, but um, bees love basil flowers. Um, uh, any other, you know, if you let your herbs flower, you know, sometimes I, you know, get on like, oh, I should have pruned my basil more because now it's going to all go to seed. But it's still doing a good job there because it's, um, you know, the, the smell of the herbs is masking the smell of your sweet, juicy tomatoes, but it's also attracting beneficials, yes. So companion planting is a great way, but also the timing. Um, are squash vine borers a problem here? Yes. Yeah. I found, and talking to my farmer friends, they don't have a problem with them at the farm scale, 
but they do seem to be a problem at the home scale. I don't know if it's something that they hang out around houses. Um, but I have found by planting my cucumbers late, about four weeks after first fro last frost, um, I avoid a lot of the, the, the big pulses of, of pest pressure, so uh, particularly the squash vine borers. Um, so um, again, this is where you get that sort of like uh, safety that you're not getting if you were a farm and that you don't have to be first to market when you're helping people design an edible landscape. And if you're putting that cucumber or that squash, vine, that squash plant in nice warm soil, it's going to catch up really fast. Um, you know, it'll be a little bit later than if you'd put it in May 1st, but you might miss a good pulse of squash vine borers or cucumber beetles. Um, eggplant's another one. Um, avoid planting it too early. If You might put it in the ground and it'll be just fine and won't get, even if you're past frost, but if the soil's not warm enough, it's just going to sit there. It's going to be a weak plant. It's not going to be um, a nice hardy plant and it's going to be more susceptible to, to flea beetles. Um, so rotation is another, is another way to, to help with pest pressure. Um, so you want to group things by family and then rotate your families. Um, you know, the, the rules that would apply on a farm, I think, again, are a little bit more slippery. So you went three years in between planting the same family in the same um, bed and you want to follow heavy feeders with light feeders. Um, I just tell my clients, like, we group things by families and set it up in a bed structure as opposed to, um, well, having no organization <laughs> and, then, um, and then just rotate it. But it's not going to, um, having that, you know, super tight system isn't as important in a farm, you're not going to confound the flying insects. It, they're not going to like, be like, well, I overwintered here and I'm just, you know, not going to fly over into that bed that's five feet away and find that your cabbages are, you know, you're, you might try to be slick, but you're not that slick. But things like soil nematodes and funguses that are, you know, uh, to, that tend to affect specific plants, it might help slow down the spread of them. Um, and Good planning is going to make that rotation a lot easier. You're also going to, you know, change when you're. It's also for um, plant nutrition. You're going to, if you move your plants around, you're not going to have the same plants taking up the same nutrient profile year after year. Why do I keep hitting this? I have this handy thing. All right. So uh, something that Krista and I spent a lot of time doing in Georgia is hand picking. Um, cabbage loopers and tomato hornworms. Cabbage loopers, I find it's extremely effective to hand pick. In the spring, you go out, it's easy to find them, you know, spend a couple of weeks being on top of it, and then the problem's gone. Um, so handpicking is get a good strategy for them. Um, egg squishing is, is pretty effective for squash bugs. Um, once they're adults, it's really hard to control, but if you take a, keep a look out for the, their little bright sort of amber-colored eggs, you can keep a pretty good handle on them. Um, and then things like aphids and even cabbage white flies, blasting them with a hose, if it, blasting the plant with a hose can be fairly effective um, up until to a certain point. At a certain point you're, you might have to decide if you sacrifice the plant or if you use a chemical intervention. So say, soap sprays can be effective against the soft-bodied stuff, aphids and white flies. Um, and garlic sprays, you can, I've, there's lots of concoction recipes out there for homemade ones or commercial ones. Um, I've never, I have a slight problems in some of my gardens with um, early blight and usually it's just, you know, I pick off damaged leaves and it doesn't seem to be, it's never gotten out of control. We did have some late bite blight in Maryland, um, that was a problem at a large scale a couple years ago and I just pulled plants. Um, and then you can use organic, if you want to use some organic sprays, there's things like neem oil and pyrethrum out there. Um, I'm always a little bit hesitant to go there. I'm, I'm just kind of of the opinion that if it's just because it was extracted from a plant, people, I think, tend to treat it as if, the, you know, you could drink it, <laughs> but it's not, it's not, you know, necessarily to be taken lightly just because it, it comes from a plant source. Um, and I also like the sort of systems level controls um, like we've been hearing about today. Um, again, getting clients to sort of have a, um, to understand that there's a time to let it go. <laughs> uh, 
when it gets to be June, I, you know, I can control my cabbage white flies um, on my kale up until end of June. And then I, you know, I can kind of, sp by hose blasting, soap spray, and then at a certain point, I just have to, to let it go and I have to pull it. Um, but this, I mean, this is something that I think client education, they're also going to have to understand that at some point, it's better to pull out your lettuce, which is bitter and doesn't taste very good anyway, and make some room for the next planting than it is because they get really attached to these plants. Um, and that's totally understandable, but, um, but same, uh, same idea with pests. Like sometimes it's just better to pull it than it is uh, to let it go and continue to affect other plants. Um, harlequin beetles, are they a problem? Those are very urban specific. Are they a problem here? They're around. Yeah. Yeah, they're a big problem in Baltimore City specifically, um, and it gets. And it, that's another one that when it gets to be hot, and they're all over your brassicas, um, and they they are not as um, t easily taken care of with something like a soap spray. Um, so when it's cabbage whitefly and harlequin beetle season, I pull my brassicas and then I replant um, a month or so later, a month or two later for my fall crop. Um, Squash bugs, another thing, like if you miss them as eggs, you might have to, to pull those plants and then wait a week or two. But the nice thing is with squash plants, you might get a chance for a second um, seeding. Um, and then also just guard, general garden clen cleanliness. Um, so keeping you know, the, the residues off the ground, kind of... Um, Eliminate, and then also in the as you winterize your garden, eliminating places where eggs can overwinter, in you know just the, your plant residues, um, and then of course you don't want to compost or any disease or heavily infested plants. I find that almost all home compost piles are co cold compost piles, so they do break down eventually, but they don't get up to those hot temperatures that are going to um, kill off pests and diseases. So, um, you know it's it's. Because people are continually adding to it, it's, it tends to be a cold compost as opposed to if you're batch composting and you get that spike in heat. So just some general principles is that all of the organic controls will require vigilance by the client. They often need repeated application, while, while, whether it's repeated picking or if you are using a soap spray, it's, it's not going to work in one, one dose. Um, and then coaching them on things like recognizing pests recognizing beneficials, such as ladybug larvae. This was a friend, not a client, who had, they were like, oh my god, look what's all over my asparagus. I'm gonna lose my asparagus, it's the third year. Um, and it was, they had missed the aphid infestation, but they, you know, so it was the, the ladybugs that were behind uh, cleaning up shop. Um, so, but recognizing that is the key step there. Um, and then, this is a parasitized hornworm. Leave that guy alone. So he can, the little parasitoids can go over. And actually, he was on my grapevines, which is kind of weird. Um, but yeah, leave him alone so that they can go destroy his friends. Um, row covers are great in a, um, on a farm setting. I don't think that they're a great fit, fit for most edible landscaping clients. <laughs> if you put a cover over it, it might keep the bugs out, but it also might keep the gardener out. And I'm just saying that purely from my own experience. If it's covered over and you're not seeing it, it might be less likely to get watered or harvested. Um, and it might be something once they kind of get to the next stage. Um, but it's also, it might not, depending on the setting, might not be fit the aesthetic that they're looking for as well. So I can say without any, you know, dishonesty that the insect pests I have not had any catastrophes because of, it, because of it. Any of my clients or in any of my school gardens, maybe you lose one or two things. And it's a learning experience. You go on, you either choose a different variety, maybe you don't plant that the next year. The furry critters might be the chink in the armor because you're planting something that is palatable to mammals. And what works for your neighbor John's problem two blocks down who has squirrels that are eating his tomatoes might not work for you because there's a little bit more personality there. Um, so there's lots of information out there, but if you go onto any of like the forums on the internet, you'll all, I mean, inevitably any conversation is like, 
I've tried this and this that you know what should I do and this person says to do this and they're like I tried that it doesn't work so it different things work for different people um, but this is a really challenging one and it's also one that I think doing this for me in the city I is a lot easier because I'm not dealing with the big D word because <laughs> as of yet we don't have deer in Baltimore City well around the edges we do but that's a hu I'm, I will be completely honest that's a, a huge one um, that can really only be dealt with um, as I say here with an eight-foot fence um, rabbits on the other hand if you surround it by a fence um, can be effective I had a client that I put in a, a rabbit proof fence um, but it's got to be a put down a foot buried um, but depending on what the clients go for they can be a little less attractive or more expensive so you, you dig a trench about a foot down and then angle it out groundhogs probably the best solution is elimination setting traps and trying to get them out of there um, although I haven't had any first-hand experience with that because um, I haven't had any groundhogs in my site um, there's lots of sort of lore out there about using deterrents to keep the furry critters away um, so pepper and garlic sprays again either homemade or commercial um, can deter squirrels and rabbits um, I've had some good luck with using a homemade just basically making a tea of cay fresh cayenne peppers that I just steeped in hot water um, and sprayed on my tomatoes and it did keep seem to keep the squirrels off of them putting dog hair around your garden um, there's the old Irish spring soap in socks tied to the fence for deer. I don't know if that works. Anybody have any experience with using that? My neighbor. And it, it works pretty well for them? Excellent. Good to know. Um, and then there's all these different predator urine concoctions that you can get out there. Um, and then as far as fruit, um, I'm going to try next year putting mothballs in, in nylons or in socks hanging from my um, peach tree just to mask the smell of it and, and keep the squirrels away. Um, so you can also just try to avoid providing what they're looking for. So I, I tell my clients, and this is the best strategy for me, squirrels tend to go for my tomatoes, sometimes for my cucumbers, but more for my tomatoes. It's just pick them in when they, they just start to blush. Um, and this will work for a lot of, um, if you have hornworm problems that you haven't gotten under control, if you get them before they're really sweet and, and ripe and juicy, they're not going to zero into them as fast. Um, or you'll read some things that say to provide an alternate water source because what they're really going for is the water in the vegetables. Um, you know, of course then you might be providing habitat for um, mosquitoes. Um, and rats, which is something that's a reality in my world, keeping your garden clean and well harvested is definitely, I mean, I will not lie, there are rats in the neighborhood around my school. They probably take some walks in the garden. They do not eat any of our vegetables because we do not let them, we don't let the sweet, funky smells accumulate by not letting fruit get overripe or be on the ground. Um, you might get a first year free because it takes the furry critters a while to zero in on, on your delicious feast that's there, um, after which you can just stop answering your clients' phone calls. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit what I was talking about, developing the information, informational infrastructure. If you're a business in Kentucky and want to start offering these services by either collaborating with other business owners or, or with extension agents, creating some sort of documents that are going to help support this, either for your staff to be able to support um, clients that want this or um, to be able to give to clients who have an interest. Um, so the list of recommended cultivars is a great thing to have on hand. Um, the visual planting calendar, like I said, people are psyched when I give that to them. It just kind of makes it, it makes it just a little easier to grok when things go in the ground. Um, and it's really easy, you know, to, I use Excel to set it up, but um, you know, that's easy to set it up as a chart and just indicate with sort of the range of dates. Um, some, some references for companion planting, especially some tried and true ones that maybe you could get master gardeners together to kind of assemble a list of their best practices for companion planting. Um, sample garden plans for different types of gardens, maybe for different family sizes. Um, and again, engaging master gardeners and developing materials. Um, I'm a master gardener and I'm a big fan of the program and I think it's a really good sort of central knowledge base of people who have first-hand skills in, in gardening in your locality. So that's um, all I have. So.